Okay. So as a quick review, uh, hopefully you guys were able to watch this uh, uh, this video, but I just wanted to highlight and start us off before we get to our uh, activities today. So um, we're obviously we're talking about last time we talked about droughts. Today we're, this this week we're talking about flooding. And uh, uh, one of the big drivers are these these um, intense rain burst events, such as uh, El Nino. Uh, in my lecture, I go over that in detail, which we'll just skip. I'll just note here that there's um, uh, two broad, I mean, there's, there's more than this, but there's two, um, to start with, there's two broad categories of flooding. There's the flooding that's going to happen when water in its traditional hydrological pathways leaves those traditional hydrological pathways. So the classic would be a stream flood, or what we typically call a flood, right, where the water overtops the banks, it goes, it goes and floods the farm fields or, or inundates the farm fields or, or you know, goes in someone's house or something of that nature. And, uh, and then another broad category is when the ocean essentially rises. So the ocean comes up. It's not, tip, not in typical hydrological um, pathways, but it's just the bathtub water rises and spills over um, into tr traditionally tr terrestrial areas. Um, as with other aspects of disasters that we've talked about, there's the, the physics of it, there's the, the, the natural ecosystem stuff going on, atmospheric going on, and then there's R going on. And so uh, obviously the meteorological stuff is a bunch of precipitation happening in a relatively short amount of time, typically. That's either coming from the sky or it could be rapid glacial melt or snow melt or something of that nature. And then the... the uh, Anthropological drivers are all the constraints we put on waterways. Again, as a reminder, we've actively tried to, you know, rejigger all the ways that water moves around the system. And historically, historically, we humans have hated water, at least in the Western world, in the Western tradition. We find water destructive, and the approach, certainly for the last 150 years, uh, has been, but, but you can argue a lot longer than that, but is, the idea has been to get the water away as fast as possible. So what that has led us to in the industrial, in the era of the industrial revolution and, and industrial might and, and all that is to build structures that rapidly take water from one place and put it in another place, ultimately dumping it uh, in places like California, ultimately dumping it in the ocean. Um, and those are all exacerbators of droughts. Um, we have things can happen very quickly on a time scale and things can happen a bit slower. So the more typical event that we're thinking of, it starts to rain, you know, starts to, we, get, we get a report of a storm coming up and oh my gosh, it's going to start raining tomorrow and then it may start to rain, then it rains a little more and then it rains a little more and then it rains a little more and then all of a sudden, oh, it starts getting wet and then the river starts to, the trickle becomes a bit of a flow, and the flow becomes a bit of a torrent, and the torrent starts to get higher and higher, and then it eventually you know, floods kind of thing. That would be a traditional flood. Um, a flash flood is um, quite different. A flash flood is stuff that happens very quickly and stops very quickly. <clears throat> um, and usually this is in an area that there isn't existing water. So it's usually not in a in a river, it's in a dry arroyo or something of that nature. Um, and uh, this is one of the most, well, all, floods are dangerous in general. You'll see in our activities today uh, that uh, the number, uh, the most costly natural disaster year in, year out in the U.S., flooding. You might think it's, might think it's earthquakes, you might think it's, it's, you know, whatever, wildfires, but, but flooding. Wildfires are, are, are Given it a run for its money uh, in recent years, unfortunately, but but um, flooding is is you know the 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 day in day out um, big cost um, in our country. Um, but a lot of the deaths also happen with these flash floods. Um, and I talk about this in my lecture. I'm just going to skip there, but I just want to play this one video here to emphasize it. So this is a bunch of hike, this is a bunch of, uh, this is a, a backpacking outfit in South America. And these folks are out, so they're out for, you know, a couple day hike. So they're starting off on the right side of the screen, they're going to the left. 
and the guides are helping these folks. So this was dry when they first started walking over here. And now it's starting to get, this is up in sort of a mountainous area. And this is, and there's a little, this is glacial melt. This is, this is melt coming from higher up in the, um, in the uh, draw, in, in the watershed. And also, yeah, okay, well, we'll watch this. So you guys, can you guys hear this? So this is all real time, right? So these guys are crossing. The guides are like, yeah, come on. And then people start saying, hey, hey. So those are all boulders like the size of the desks you guys are looking at. So it's starting to die down now. So th that's how quick, right? That's how quick this stuff can spin up and spin down. So these, um, these flash flood uh, efforts can come in these pulses like this and can be super surprising. Um, a they're a classic phenomenon of, they're a classic phenomenon of uh, arid areas. So the Southwest, deserts of California, et cetera, um, where we routinely get very intense dumps of rain in a very short period of time. In much of the Southwest, this is, um, this is a summertime phenomenon. This is a sort of, you know, like two to, two to three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And you always get these, you know, these, these, these thunderstorms that come over and they just dump. And because of the landscape where we have these these you know, slot canyons and, and, and arroyos and things of that nature, you can get this water flowing um, very quickly in these channels. And the rainfall, the rain event might be, you know, who knows, I don't know, five miles away or something, right? So you might not even hear it. You might not even see the clouds, but all of a sudden it pops up and pops down. This is a particularly dramatic example from, from, southern, uh, from South America here. Um, but, but it really does show the power of those. And so you can see how easy it is to get trapped. So one of the classic things when new people go to hike in Canyonlands or places like that in the Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, places like that, um, you know, they're they're naive and they're like, oh my God, it's such a nice day, it's super hot, it's 100 and whatever, 10 degrees, beautiful canyons. I'm gonna go walk in these beautiful canyons, and those uh, unfortunately uh, decent numbers of folks pass away every year getting caught in these um, types of uh, events. So anyway, so, so uh, there's all kinds of variants that I talked about in my lecture um, that you guys can uh, look at um, uh, based on, on the location and the constraints. As with all of our disasters, the key elements are how intense was it? How long did it go for, right? So how, how, how energetic was it? And then how much, uh, what length of time were we exposed to that, um, to that problem? Um, in terms of measuring this stuff, we have a couple of key things, uh, one of which we have some of this on, we have this, so obviously we have rain gauges around, we can measure how much is raining. But as far as water moving in, in uh, constrained areas like river channels, we typically use um, uh, stream gauges uh, where we measure uh, this. Um, so everybody, hopefully everybody's seen Camp Park, everybody's gone to Camp Park on campus. Uh, if you haven't, taking field methods yet or whatever, next time you're going out there or you're, you're leaving campus going towards Lewis Road, you head out and uh, uh, right before you, you cross the river and you turn right, which is where you drive into Camp Park, 
after about 100 feet or so off the road, you'll see a cylinder, like sort of a cylinder, little, little, K, little, little booth thing with an antenna on the top. That is a United States Geological Service uh, stream gauge station. And so we have these over all these different streams all around the, uh, the country. And this is um, constantly measuring every five minutes the, the water level. And it's saying, you know, is, it, is, is water one foot above, two foot above, three foot above, whatever the bottom of the channel. And so we're constantly recording this. And the con some of these are, are recorded. Um, so historically, these things were recorded on a, on a drum or sort of a, a physical recording device. And then every so often, people had to go out and, and pull those. Now, in most cases, I, I suspect there probably are still a few like that. But, but now, um, essentially, all of them are real time, or most of them are real time. So in our cases, ours uses a radio frequency to, to translate it to the Ventura, um, uh, watershed, Ventura County Watershed Protection District. And they, they capture this data and they report it real time. And so you guys can look at the real time water level of Cayugas Creek or the Santa Clara River or, or whatever. And that uh, is a great help in terms of, um, you know, so we could, in other words, we could have an instrument up up in, up uh, in Santa Clarita, right? And oh my gosh, we see a, a rise in water level. We could, we could send a warning to folks in Fillmore, a warning to folks in, in Ventura or Oxnard. That, oh my gosh, this, this pulse is coming down. You, you can't maybe do it in hours, but you certainly could give folks at least several minutes of warning so they could you know, get out of the flood uh, zone. Uh, questions about that? Any general questions about that the flooding stuff? Okay, um, why don't I pause that? Uh, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to say? Um, yeah, so, so basically a hydrograph is, I guess I'll just end with this. A hydrograph is the way we, we visualize how that water is moving, right? And you can take Dr. Fairfax's hydrology class if you guys want to learn more about this stuff. But essentially, it's, uh, a hydrograph is a plot of water, um, the amount of water over time, right? Typically, it's the height of the water um, over time, and uh, those can be really helpful uh, to uh, look at the pattern. Oh, yeah, that's what I want to say. Look at the pattern. Um, yeah, right. So the last thing I wanted to say, uh, just as, as a reiteration of what I said in the regular lecture, is that um, we have uh, to talk about risk here when we get to flooding. So this, this pertains to all of our disasters, right? There, there's risk associated with all of our disasters. There's probabilities and all this and that. Um, we have a huge, uh, we inherited a huge problem by some bad decisions that were made many years ago. We typically use what's known as the 100 year flood event or 100 year storm event to do a lot of our planning in the US. Why? because we're stupid when it comes to understanding math and risk and, and numbers and stuff like that. So, okay, what, what, is, um, what is 100? So, so first we'll talk about the story as it historically existed. And that is, you know, half a century or so ago, people are like, hey, let, let, let's figure out a better way to estimate stuff. And, and long story short, we um, said, well, let's, let's talk about a, a once, once a century event or, 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 or or uh, ha something that would happen only once every 100 years. That sounds pretty rare, right? Right? And it kind of does. It sounds like, oh, man, once in 100 years. Ah, that's, that's, yeah. I, I, it would be great if I could live to be 100 years old. I don't know if that's going to happen, but, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, that is full of problems. From the get-go, that is um, not a very conservative number. So just starting out the blocks. So before we do anything else, even though that might sound to a naive person as if that's a, that's a, that, that's a conservative measure or something, that is not conservative at all. Yeah, Em. Exactly. Right. It's not once every hundred years, there's a one in a hundred chance that happens. 
Right. And again, a lot of this comes from the fact that we, that, that many of us aren't routinely schooled in probability and risk and what ifs, right? So um, when we hear, when we hear something like the vaccine is um, whatever, 86% effective or whatever, people are like, ooh, 86, that's not, that's, that's not so good, right? I, I want the, I want the 91% effective vaccine or something. So I don't even want that 86 one, right? Um, you know, compared to not getting a vaccine, sure, if you could have a stronger vaccine, sure, I want a stronger vaccine, but, but um, way better to have any vaccine than none. And it actually turns out in some cases that 86% quote unquote effective vaccine actually can work better than the 91% vaccine. So, so what happens is when we communicate probability and, and chances of something happening in our society, most people think that is a real number and it's not, right? It's an estimate and there's error associated with that, right? There's noise around that thing, but we always seem to center on only the, only the average, only the, the one single number. Okay, so anyway, okay, so, so that, that's the setup. So, so let's talk about the, the once in a century quote unquote event. Um, okay. Uh, so as with other things, as with temperature and, and other stuff, uh, uh, this is the situation, right? So this is, this is an example of uh, some flows in a, in a river. And this, this would be considered a, a quote-unquote a 10-year flood, meaning a flood event that, that on average only happens once every 10 years, right? But have a look, right? There's lots, just like... Um, uh, rainfall totals and stuff of that nature as we've discussed before. Yes, there, you can calculate a mathematical number as an average, but almost never, I mean, maybe this year, right here, maybe, maybe this year, right here, maybe, uh, maybe this year, right here. So maybe three years out of this, you know, basically 100-year 100 100 year time span um, is, the, is the event happening at, at the level of the average, right? If we instead look at the, the, the gaps between the year, right? So, so if this is the 10-year flood time, uh, this, would be, this would exceed the 10-year flood. This would exceed. So between when we first started taking records, it was 17 years before we got a quote-unquote 10-year flood. Then it was 11 years. That seems, that seems fairly good. Then it was five years. That doesn't seem very good. Then it was seven years. Eh, seven years. Yeah. Then it was four years. That doesn't seem very good. Then it was seven years. Eh. Then it was 28 years, right? So, so again, um, when people hear 10-year, you know, a, a 10-year event or, or once every 10 years, people think that means once every 10 years. It's not, right? It's a, it's, it's a long-term averaging of things that are going on. Uh, and, and we don't always have robust kick-butt data. And now in places like we have large urban centers or large population centers like uh, Camarillo with uh, Thousand Oaks or Camarillo with Cayugas Creek, like Ojai or Ventura with the Ventura River, et cetera, we do have, we do have uh, uh, gauges on those streams. But not every single uh, stream, every single place, right? So we don't have perfect data. Again, especially 50 years ago or, or 75 years ago when we started making these, these calculations, right? So the data we're using, so the data we're using aren't, aren't great. The events themselves are very noisy, right? It's, it's up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then the world is changing, right? Obviously the biggest thing you're probably thinking of is climate change, right? So, so as, as our manipulating of the atmosphere is changing, that's changing the probability of rain events, right? Similarly, we're adding more concrete. We're channelizing more streams and things of that nature. So, so the landscape is not static. So, so the, the precipitation world is changing. The world upon which that precipitation lands is changing. And the, the, the simplistic calculations might lead us astray. So all that is sort of setting us up for um, uh, some problems. Um, 
Yeah, there's, I go into this. Uh, so this is what um, so this is what M was kind of talking about. So this is perhaps a better way, and you'll see this today when we get onto our data exercise. So um, a, a, a 100 year flood event um, is you know meant to imply that it has a probability of happening of a one percent chance of happening every year over a century, right? With with the the idea, with the implication that one of these events will happen once a century, on average, right? On average. But let's talk about things that. So it's much more helpful to put things into to um, language that is relevant to the folks bearing the potential risk can understand. So you guys are young. You mostly don't own homes yet. And maybe you know, with the housing market, maybe you guys never own homes. Oh, too soon. That's horrible. Don't say that. Um, so, so, but when you do get a home, most folks either get like a 15-year or a 30-year mortgage, right? So that's where most of us don't have enough money to just buy a house outright. We're not, we're not some Hollywood actors or something like that, right? Or some, some Texas billionaires or something, right? Um, so what we do is we put some money down and then we get a bank loan. And we, in the context of a home, we call that a mortgage. And so then the bank actually owns the house and we pay them off, right? We pay them off the, 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 the money plus the interest. So that by the end of that loan period, at the end of that mortgage period, 15 or 30 years, um, we pay the last check and then we actually own the home. And that's also important because that has to do with flood insurance. So the bank owns the home. So the bank say, hey, if you're going to do this, you're going to buy insurance because we want to protect our investment, right? If you buy your home, you know, on the clear on your own, you don't necessarily have to buy insurance. You probably should, right? Because the fire comes, the flood comes, but, but no one's forcing you to, right? Because of the mortgage system, that's why most people are, are um, essentially forced to buy insurance. Okay, so let's take the 30-year mortgage. So if we take a 30-year mortgage, this, and, and our home, is in the so-called hundred-year floodplain, or or has a hundred, it has a probability of, of one in a hundred uh, of, of experiencing a flood event, right? Or, or, or once in a century flood event. Again, at first that sounds not too much, but over the life of that thirty-year mortgage, that's about a one in four chance of that happening. That's a very different thing to communicate, right? So by your before you own this home, there's you know a one in four chance that it's going to be flooded. Like, that's, oh, that's, that's different. Other places in the world use much more conservative estimates in terms of the, what, what they're willing to live with in terms of flood risk. And the classic would be the, the northern European countries that have historically experienced lots and lots of flooding. And so the Netherlands is the classic example here. And they use um, either... Uh, a one in 12,050 year probability event as their marker, or in so, and that's for stuff that's not super important. For stuff that's super important, like schools or hospitals or, or power genera generating stations, they use one in 10,000 year probability is what they consider acceptable risk, right? Very, very different. And so, um, yeah, is that what I wanna say? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say that, 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 so, so that, those are all the problems with using a one in 100 year event, you know, mindset, but then with all of our crazy changing world, it's getting, uh, those old estimates generally aren't right. Those generally estimates are way too low. So you'll hear this about people say, oh man, the, the once in a century fire, or once in a century flood, or once in a century rain at the storm, right? Now we're seeing like once in five, one, one in 500 year events happening and happening like three years ago and then happening this year. And so um, uh, people are, some people are starting to realize this and go, wait, how could a once in 500 year event happen like twice in the last you know, few years type of deal? So again, it gets to understanding risk and, uh, and, and having a wider cultural debate as to what is acceptable to us in terms of our level of safety and stuff of that nature. And that's going to play right into our, our, our efforts today. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at um, a couple different things. We're going to look at, um, so, so the, okay, so uh, the way the insurance market typically works 
is someone says, hey, I want to ship my bananas across the, the ocean. And I'm going to put all this money in and buy a, buy a ship. And that ship is going to, we're put our bananas on it, and it's going to go across the ocean. Okay. Uh, I've invested a lot of money. What happens if a storm comes up and breaks my ship, right? So a long time ago in human society, uh, arose in various places around the world in different forms. But basically people said, hey, okay, how about this? How about you give me a little bit of money? And if something happens to your boat, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a new boat, right? So that was the birth of the insurance industry. It's grown up a lot, and it's, and it's changed and, and morphed in different ways. Um, in the context of, of flood insurance, what we're talking about is when your, your home or your property is damaged, that company will come in and replace, replace the materials or help you rebuild the, the um, structure or, or what have you. Um, what's, what we're increasingly seeing, because of the lack of, of robust governance in terms of dealing with natural disasters, many insurers are leaving the insurance pool. With fire, this is happening. Um, so many people in uh, California in the last two years have seen their um, fire, uh, their, their, their rates for their fire protection jump at least 25%, if not you know, multi, you know, 200, 300%. Um, and so many insurers have looked at it and said, you know, this wildfire risk, it's becoming too common and we don't think we're going to make money off of it. The other thing that happened is starting in the 80s, um, uh, insura insurance companies in the U.S. used to primarily be, um, you know, uh, steady businesses and kind of, you know, this and that, make some money. And go. Starting in the 80s, they started being purchased by Wall Street. And so Wall Street wants to see constant improving revenue returns. So, so the economic calculus used to be, okay, we have this much money in the bank and we're going to make a, a bit of money, right? Um, really starting with the 80s, that has sort of been jettisoned. And it's like, we got to make more profit. We got to make more profit. We got to make more profit. And one of the consequences of that has been for, folk, for the insurance industry to, to, to take a much stricter look at um, who should get insured and what, what gambles are they willing to bet. Back in the day, insurance companies were much more willing to insure some people that were risky because most of the folks weren't. We're moving more to an era where any kind of elevated risk, the insurance companies are like, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. And so what that means is if, you're, if your home is out in the wildlands urban interface or if you're a family in a poor neighborhood, right, and your, your grandma owned the house and your parents owned the house and now you own the house, um, all of a sudden now maybe it's a flood risk. Insurance, is a, insurance folks are going like, yeah, no, I don't think we're going to pay for that. So, so what governments have done is created some type of uh, subsidized or, or overreaching insurance plan. In the context of today's discussion, that's the National Flood Insurance Plan or program. Um, and so that's a national plan that essentially um, provides flood insurance where people can't get flood insurance. And so who's eligible? That, those are folks that are within the so-called flood maps or the, or the, the potential 100-year flood zones um, uh, on a map. And if you're a bank, you'll look at that and go, oh, this property, this business, this home is in this flood area. So um, if, if we're going to do a, a business loan to buy that building or a home loan to, to buy that home, uh, we're going to require them to get flood insurance. And if they can't get it elsewhere, they got to go through the National Flood Insurance Program. All kinds of problems with the National Flood Insurance Program, as with many of these things. So we have, in California, we have um, essentially uh, this. The biggest one for us is uh, earthquakes. So we have a, a, an earth, a similar kind of insurance plan for folks that can't get earthquake insurance. You can buy into this. Uh, this, this, this shared pool. Um, yeah, there's other things we can talk about insurance, but, but that's the setup for today. So um, our activities for today are to go poke around. We're going to first look at just sort of the lay of the land with, with, uh, with flood insurance and, and, and that kind of stuff. And then we're going to talk about flood events and look at flood risk. And there's, there's two different flavors we're going to look at. Um, or actually, sorry, step back. So, so also part of this also is uh, 
uh, disaster declarations. So disaster declarations are, uh, federal disaster declarations are what we do when we cannot, um, when we cannot, um, we, we run out of resources, right? So disaster response is a local phenomenon, and when the city, so the city has some capacity to deal with flooding, right? City budgets and city workers and stuff. When that exceeds the city's ability, then we go to the county. Like, Yo, county, I need help because this flooding is happening. And then when the county runs out of you know, capacity, money, or people, or whatever, then the county goes to the state. And when the state runs out of ability to respond to it, it goes to the feds. We've learned over the years that you know, if, if we have a big, massive earthquake that that's, that's just happens, or a hurricane comes in, we know from lots of experience we're not going to be able to, you know, we can't do that in Camarillo, right? Oxnard can't rebuild from the earthquake, right? So, um, so that started this, this, this procedure, and that's essentially where we are now, where we have a, what's called a federal uh, disaster declaration. Uh, and, and so that has to happen first. In some cases, we can, if we know there's a massive, massive hurricane coming on, we can, we can sort of prime the pumps. But basically, um, uh, the state or the tribal government, depending on where we're talking about, um, says, hey, does some things either preliminary or after the disaster is struck, they take some measurements and they go, oh my gosh, this is how many people were hurt, this is how much property was damaged, this is the acreage, you know, whatever, they, they go through this quick assessment, and then they go to the feds and they go, hey, you guys, we need, we need help, and then uh, the president will declare a, a federal disaster zone of a particular geographic reach, and then that starts resources flowing. So the first thing you guys will look at is you'll look at uh, an example of, of disaster declarations, and then we'll go and we'll look at, um, we'll look at uh, flood maps and flood risks. And so um, with the flood risks, there's two different flavors. There is the FEMA um, uh, flood hazard, the, 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 the FEMA mapping um, uh, effort that you guys can check out. I have that in three different versions for you. I would encourage you to look at at least two of them, um, but it's all the same underlying data. So if you, want, if, you, if you like Google Earth, you could use, download a KMZ and use that in Google Earth. If you like the ArcGIS viewer, you could do that. If you like to use just sort of more of a graphical interface from a website, you can do that, but it's all the same data underlying it. And this is gonna say, again, if an area is in one of these flooding, you know, flood likely areas or not. Uh, well, all those problems I said about, hey, it could be worse than that. What if it's more frequent is totally true, but at least this is a starting point, right? So this is, this is uh, uh, a, a tool to see if we're maybe, our business or our infrastructure is potentially in danger. And then the other one is an independent effort to do this a bit better. First Street. So this is a, an NGO's compiled data um, with a bunch of folks, Republicans, Democrats, private sector, government people, that were just getting really tired of this lack of rigorous um, communication of risk to the pub, general public. So there are services that will do this if you're a big fancy bank or you're you know, Chevron or you're you know, whatever, a Fortune 500 company. You could hire consulting firms that could give you like really nice data and, and you know, model this and that for your, your buildings, your infrastructure. First Street was trying to do that for everybody. So, that, so, so try to make this data publicly available, rigorous, open source, but also do it in a way that's more, perhaps more user friendly um, and more relevant to us. So, so there's those two different ways I want you guys to, to play around with and look at um, flood risk. And that's what we're doing today. And so for both of them, I, I, I give you guys, hey, go look at, Go, you can type in addresses, city names, or actual you know, street addresses, or what have you. And so for these, I, I say, hey, go look at these, and then also pick a couple that are relevant to you. So you guys are going to explore today. Cool? Make sense? All right. Go for it. So the, the module should be open for you guys now.